tragic end for a man crossing the Poriporana freeway. Supreme Court rejects Sir McCary's application. And the world's fastest man does it again in Rio. This is National MTV News with Lorraine Gabina. Good evening and thank you for joining us on Friday's News. A nasty road accident in Port Moresby has claimed the life of a security guard. The deceased, identified as Paro Kusi, was hit by a Toyota truck and died instantly. Kusi was crossing the Poriporina Freeway at Gordon's opposite the South Pacific Brewery when he met his fate. This footage, taken 20 minutes after the accident, shows the body of the late Kusi trapped under the truck. Eyewitnesses Simon Needle and John Warwa said Kusi was on his way to work when he was hit. He was employed as a security guard with Millennium Security. The truck that hit him dragged him for about four meters and hit another vehicle, which was traveling on the inner lane. But I'm dying to sleep on it like that. I'm going to stop saying things across the road. So, then I'm come. I'm going to meet him. 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 Senior Constable Philip Paru and his team were the first officers at the scene. They quickly blocked off part of the freeway leading towards central Waigani, cleared the crowd and controlled the traffic, which was already building up. The fire truck and St. John ambulance arrived minutes later. <laughs> When this guy saw the guy walking across the road, he tried to avoid him. And in avoiding, he actually hit him and brought him across that little cement slab there and hit him against the, uh, the flower at the back there, flower cement, and also hit the other CRV, which is on the other side. Um, the pedestrian was instantly dead. This is due to the negligence of the driver who was driving dangerously. However, because the body was stuck against the middle aisle, it took several minutes to lift the truck and remove the body. The two vehicles involved in the accident were towed to the Boroko police station. This is the second road accident reported to police today. Another accident occurred at Ohola, also along the Poreporana freeway. Police will be working to identify the driver who fled the scene. Tecla Gunga, National MTV News. The Supreme Court today rejected an application by Chairman of the PNG Sustainable Development Program, Se Mekere Morauta, regarding the PNG SDP shares in Octedi Mining Limited. A new mining act was passed in 2013, which allowed for all the shares belonging to PNG SDP to be transferred to the state. The application was for the court to interpret the act called the Octedi 10th Supplemental Agreement, or TSA, on whether or not it is unconstitutional. The Supreme Court ruled out the application based on two factors. Firstly, the application was not of public interest, but for the commercial interest of the Sustainable Development Program. Secondly, the applicant, Sam Mekere Morata, failed to clarify to the court if his application was of public interest. Following the two factors, the Supreme Court ruled that SDP, which was a registered foreign company, was mostly affected and Sam Mekere was used to come to the court for their benefit. In 2013, the National Parliament passed the TSA Act. Following the enactment, PNG SDP shares in OTML were cancelled and transferred to the state. The TSA Act provides for compensation to be paid for as property by the state. Sam Mekere, who is also the chairman of PNG SDP, sought relief to have its shares returned. He filed this application for the court to interpret if the TSA Act is unconstitutional, invalid and of no force or effect. However, 
the Supreme Court was in favor of the PNG government, arguing that Se Mekere was acting solely for foreign interest. The Supreme Court found that Se Mekere does not have the standing to bring this matter to the court. The court ruled that his application was incompetent and abused of the court's process. Pasenata Yama, National MTV News. The central bank, together with the Border Development Authority, have inked a partnership to bring financial literacy to communities along Papua New Guinea's international borders. The MOU signed this week will now enable the bank to educate border communities on the importance of being financially, financially literate and ultimately build a financial savings culture. As part of the rollout in providing financial literacy programs, the Bank of Papua New Guinea has secured another strategic partner. This week, BPNG signed an MOU with the Border Development Authority to provide financial literacy training to communities along Papua New Guinea's borders. On hand to ink this deal were BPNG Assistant Governor Ellison Pittick and BDA Executive Chairman Fred Konga. According to Mr. Pittick, this MOU is another demonstration of the importance of government agencies working together to provide life-saving financial literacy training to our people. It's exciting. Um, it's very much in line with uh, one of our seven commitments under the strategy for financial inclusion, which we, we set out to, uh, to, to see that financial inclusion, financial literacy is mainstream through the processes of provincial governments. But we have taken it beyond that now. Uh, we have taken it through the uh, Border Development Authority. The MOU is a very exciting uh, uh, step forward uh, to, to see actually it boils right down to the people in the rural areas uh, where they, have not, uh, don't, they do not have access to, to a special training uh, to how to manage money. For the BDA, this program is part of its trade and investment project and an integral exercise in ensuring that communities along the country's borders understand the importance of saving their money and ultimately create a savings culture. This is the second phase. First phase is skills training. So we do skills training for them to prepare them to do to, to, to business uh, in the different areas. But then it comes to financial uh, uh, finance and financial knowledge and uh, and financial management. So this is where they best come in. And we've got this uh, MOU which will pave the way for us to move forward. Mary Batulo, National MTV News. An overarching policy on energy provision in Papua New Guinea is set to be delivered to the National Executive Council by the end of this year. The Department of Petroleum and Energy recently provided an update on the development of the national energy policy, emphasizing the need for closer collaboration between all stakeholders. There is an ambitious plan by the government to provide electricity to 70% of Papua New Guineans by the year 2030. This is to be achieved in line with a proposed national energy policy. The Department of Petroleum and Energy has been given the task to lead the development of this policy and has been working closely with other stakeholders to ensure this policy is completed and presented to the National Executive Council. We have already have a draft policy in place right now. And, and we need to have further consultation on this. So we are inviting an independent assessor to come and do a review on this policy. Uh, basically, we'll be uh, engaging University of Technology in Sydney to come and do the review. Once the review is up, then they'll do up a cabinet paper on that and will be presented to the government for endorsement. Hopefully by December, November, December this year, we should have an energy policy up and approved. As is the case with other government plans, it will require close cooperation by all within the energy sector, something which looks all the more likely given the close collaboration by all relevant parties in recent times. Our mandate given by the government is we need to electrify the country by 70% of the households by 2030. But the gentleman that did a presentation based on 100% electrification. The challenge is how we can get this plan to the politicians. Uh, we need to get a political support and political will. That's the biggest challenge. I think our minister is keen to roll out this so that we'll, we'll, when this is over, we'll, I'll brief him on exactly what's going to happen and we'll, we'll be updated on so that it's up to him to try to get his uh, colleagues to get, uh, get into this plan. 
Mary Batulo, National MTV News. In the news ahead, the coffee cupping competition in Ley, Tuna Nomics, the business of tuna fisheries and Puma Energy's recertification. Welcome back to the news. The winners of the third national coffee cupping competition in Leh will be announced tonight, which will pave way for fresh export opportunities for the winners. Experts have been tasting coffee samples from more than 120 cooperatives over the last three days to determine the best. The good news for PNG Coffee is that 90 have been found to have the required qualities for export. Today, the top 10 were finalized. These are the last top 10 samples from Papua New Guinean farmers from 13 provinces. 127 cooperatives took part in the third annual cupping competition in Leh. 90 of the samples ended up ranking very high, according to the cupping experts. The experts don't know where the coffee comes from or who produces them. For them, it's a matter of assessing the coffee and then collating the data against the codes provided for each coffee sample. So to extract those qualities, we have to prepare it well from the farm level, processing level, and then we can use this as a marketing tool to market it. By midnight, farmers will know who owns the best ranked coffee in Papua New Guinea. The ranking given by this team of international coffee experts will set the stage for market opportunities overseas. Through this process and exposure, one kilogram of coffee destined for speciality markets could fetch the farmer up to 90 kina per kilo, much more than what farmers would get through the usual exports. Now, before me plant, before me no save coffee, me come salim name go away, make it one can walk plug again, one can make it minus away. But now me time come to look up in competition, me save the walk plug again, now me yet walk in packets, can it a mountain coffee and print name from me plant. But problems remain. Transportation, consistency and quality are key to ensuring that PNG coffee remains on the top of the list for international buyers. Scott Wade, National MTV News, Lay. 60% of the world's fish comes from the Pacific, and the region as a whole has made enormous strides in fisheries management and development. Papua New Guinea is at the forefront of this progress. Through the National Fisheries Authority and Regional Organization, the Pacific Island Forum Fisheries Agency, steps are being taken to ensure the sustainable management of tuna for the economic benefits of the Pacific community. Annually, at least 2.5 million metric tons of the global tuna catch is destined for canning, the majority of which is caught by purse seine vessels. The Regional Roadmap for Sustainable Pacific Fisheries anticipates a doubling in the value of the region's tuna catch by 2024, from a 2014 value of 3.1 million U.S. dollars. To say tuna is important is an understatement. Today, tuna is the planet's most valuable fish. The term tunanomics was coined by the Pacific's fisheries industry stakeholders to define the movement and importance of Pacific tuna, not merely the sustainability, but more so the economic importance and viability. Tunanomics is the, uh, the, the term that we've coined to really um, give uh, perspective to the fact that uh, while uh, our first step in fisheries management is always to create sustainability, uh, in the developing world we also need to turn our attention to economics uh, and to making sure that we can secure uh, appropriate um, domestic returns from those sustainable fish stocks. Papua New Guinea being one of the bigger Pacific Island nations is a major player in the region's tuna exports. However, this also means that a lot of its responsibilities rest on the country's shoulders. These include strictly regulating fishing to within the exclusive economic zones and the fight against illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, which if not policed, has a detrimental effect on the market. And the work that we need to do is largely with the licensed fleet in terms of improving their performance, particularly when it comes to data reporting. So it is a very significant issue. Uh, our best estimate is that uh, it's worth 
uh, somewhere around $150 million across the region yeah. in terms of lost money to the Pacific. Leanne Girari, National MTV News. Puma Energy PNG has achieved another milestone with the company this week achieving ISO recertification. The recertification has confirmed Puma Energy's reputation an industry leader in PNG by promoting international best practice. Since its entry into the Papua New Guinea market, Puma Energy has worked on improving its work standards. And this week, the company received further good news with Puma Energy PNG achieving ISO recertification in four areas. The recertification covered international safety management, environmental management, quality management, and Australia New Zealand safety management systems. For Puma Energy country manager Jim Collings, this is a testament to the efforts put in by staff in creating a safer, more productive working environment across its operations. These standards are internationally audited and they're independently audited, yes? That's right. Uh, so there's about other, another set of eyes coming to see us, but some of the feedback that I got was about how excited our people were about the difference they were making, not only to themselves by the learning and development, but also what they were doing here. Uh, a change in the standards coming up uh, in 2018. We hope to implement those changes in 2017 and these are moving away from rigid procedures uh, and moving more to what they call process flow. So we have inputs, we have a process and we have some outputs and it's, it's relying less on stringent procedures where they can easily be, uh, steps can be uh, missed or, or not done which can create uh, issues in the workplace and for our customers. According to Collings, the recertifications certainly increases the confidence for potential for investors to partner with Puma in investing in Papua New Guinea. An industry leader um, setting standards for others to aspire to, it really gives the regulators a benchmark to target. Now, I think we all know as we go around the country, we see some substandard activities which are legacy issues. Uh, and the faster the regulators can pick up on the levels that we're doing here and drive that through with no compromise means that as a country we just lift to another level. Yeah? So our environment is protected, our people are protected, our international reputation is protected and therefore we're going to continue to flourish as a country. I think the, the other part around that is that as to do these things you have to invest heavily. Mirabatulo, National MTV News. And now looking at our finance news, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.3155 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.3080 US dollars, 0.3978 Australian dollars, 0.2683 Euro and 30.42 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, coffee and cocoa closed higher while gold and copra, cop, copra closed the day lower. Copper closed lower while palm oil crude oil closed the day higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 23.76 points higher, the ASX is trading at 27.23 points higher, and the All Ordinaries is trading at 20.87 points higher. Five political parties deregistered, lay residents question maintenance of street roads, and the Obamas featured in a film. Those stories after the break. Welcome back. The Office of the Registry of Political Parties is advising the 34 registered parties that technical and legal issues surrounding the registration of political parties have surfaced. The issue came to light after the registry's lawyer, under a directive from Registrar Dr. Alphonse Gelu, discovered that five of these parties have failed to meet requirements under the Investment Promotion Authority and were currently deregistered under IPA. The revised organic law on the integrity of political parties and candidates or OLIPAC outlines that for a political party to be eligible for registration, they must first be registered as an association under IPA. Furthermore, 
a copy of the Certificate of Incorporation as an association must be submitted with an application to register as a political party. These two provisions of the OLIPAC mean the parties in question can no longer be registered as political parties. And then the they don't need to go here. He comes straight here to us and really they start the responsible parties. But we are doing this because the current of the United States that you have to register first as an association and then you come and really say as a political party. So we are trying to make things easier for political parties by doing that. The register is concerned that with the looming national elections just eight months away before the issue of writs, this problem may hinder the preparations of parties concerned. He said he's looking at the possibility of allowing these parties to re-register with IPA and the registry of political parties. Uh, we, will, we, will, we will call on the border as soon as possible because, you know, uh, as I've said, it's only about eight to nine months. The issue of which will be on eight to 20th, uh, 2017. So if you look at the time, uh, it's not on their side. Gallo could not disclose the names of the five parties, saying the parties themselves have yet to be notified. He said that of the five, three parties have nine members currently in parliament. The search, he said, is part of an initiative by the Registry of Political Parties to ensure that political parties become institutions that respect the rule of law in their dealings. In that regard, he said it was the responsibility of parties to check their status with IPA in order to maintain compliance with legal requirements. Milisika Viro, National MTV News. Lay residents have raised questions about the maintenance of street roads within suburban areas. Today, commuters told MTV News that only some roads in, along Lay City streets are getting fixed while others are deteriorating. Bethany Harriman with this report. Ghani Street in Lay City's Eriku suburb is in a deteriorating state. This morning, cars had to pass through pond-like potholes. The main roads of Leh have been fixed. That means regular traffic jams. Streets have become detours. Ghani Street is one of them. Leh residents that drive along the road are appalled by it. That main road and BC also come also, but this uh, portals make him now. Now I'm okay that jammed up on main road side. So. Residents say that road works happening around Leh City seem to be concentrated on locations deemed high end. Now, government name look seven and threaten this little road blow, big by big ball, potholes is that people can look in now. Lenya, now side blow all money, so work money now. Big black company, but you looking more street blow and more right. There are road improvements being made around the city by contractors, however, there are still street roads that need to be fixed. The national government, through a direct intervention, has spent over 700 million kina on lay roads alone. But much of the funding were going into main roads. Streets, however, have been left to deteriorate and more work still needs to be done. Attempts to speak to the provincial works department were unsuccessful this afternoon. Bethany Harriman, National MTV News, Lay. A total of 112,000 kina, including eight pigs, were given away by the Western Highlanders as a form of compensation payment to the Southern Highlanders in Port Moresby. This follows the death of a Port Moresby International School student from Southern Highlands in a car accident last year. Eric Harupma with this report. Yesterday year next to Kony Tigers Oval, where the place is cleared, was the largest compensation payment recorded in NCD. The LT Pilambe tribe of Agen Central in the Western Islands province paid 70,000 kina, including eight pigs, as the final compo to Joe Alupia from Yelibu in the Southern Islands province over the death of his son. MTV understands that the deceased Asaya Alupia was killed in a car accident last year at Soguri Gorge outside of Port Mosby. I'm Kara Blomiblo, LT Pilambe. I've been killing Pignini Blong uh, Joe Alupia. Andablo Sogeri, time all uh, students or lady organize him this la trip. He go was also Andablo uh, Crystal Rabbits. Now only come back now, only accident long uh, Sogeri click. Following the incident, a first payment made was for the 2,000 kina in a peak last year as bell call payment of a peace stock. 
This amounted to 112,000 kina and eight pigs given away to the parents and relatives of the deceased. I'm lawyer, you black and look him, you black give him 70,000 cash, one time seven black pig. Now last year, me black give him 42,000, one time one black pig. So total compensation, and me black work him was 112,000, now eight black pig. Although compensation is not recognized under the law as past section 390A of the criminal code, it is seen by many as a mediating process and accepted as a norm in PNG culture. NCD Attentive Dispute Resolution and Peace Mediation Coordinator Chief Sergeant Ben Isekuma said after it did argument, this has prompted the NCDC Peace and Good Order Committee to intervene to bring peace and harmony between the two parties. Now, me been uh, advocate or talk savvy all some compensation and need law, law, Mama Law, believe me, law, Papua New Guinea. Section PNG Criminal Code Section 390A, and we talk demand for compensation. You know, allow. You know, allow. So, me talking online, law, Paul Sam, when I'm something you give him, you must give him long free will. Not, you know, all some money intimidating you or threatening you or using some black kind of force. Leaders, law, me blow looking for some, and me through one blood something, life, and me lose. So, demand blow all, all you know, all you know, like him. So now people are talking display demand. And now display demand and by go along all display line. Why? Because all again people are supposed to one life and lose. Now you blow line certain islands, you blow not claiming display demand blow you blow because on understanding that a life was lost, the LT Pilambi tribe has agreed to make a final payment to the deceased parents and relatives. Eric Arupma, National MTV News. Turning overseas now, we've heard their playlists, watched them dance together, and now Americans and the rest of the world can see Barack and Michelle Obama on their first date in a film that follows the future president wooing his future wife over the course of a day. Southside with You dramatizes the Obamas' first date in the summer of 1989 and sees Michelle Robinson, a 25-year-old lawyer from Chicago, going out with Barack Obama, a summer associate at her law firm. Over the hours they spend together, which Michelle initially insists is not a date, the two attend an Ernie Barnes art exhibition, a community meeting, a screening of Spike Lee's movie Do the Right Thing, have drinks and eat ice cream as they discuss their lives, ambitions and fears. You see in that moment in 1989 the seeds of who they were eventually going to become. Uh, he was working in the community, she was a lawyer, um, they started working together and um, they were seeing what was happening in their community. Southside with You takes details that the Obamas have shared about their first dates in various interviews and imagines the conversations they may have had. Parker Sawyers, the actor who plays Barack Obama in the film, said he started off with a strong impersonation of the president, but then let the mannerisms and speech inflections of his character come naturally. The rapport between the two is courteous and playful in the film. Barack Obama, who turned 28 that summer, married Michelle in 1992, three years after their first date. The black community of Chicago's South Side serves as a backdrop to the story. Michelle gets a glimpse of the future U.S. president's early leadership skills when he takes her to a community meeting to find a way to build a youth center. Later, the two momentarily clasp hands as they watch a harrowing scene in Do the Right Thing, where a black man dies after being placed in a chokehold by a white policeman. Trukai Sports is next. We'll have all the updates from the Rio Olympics. Stay with us. Two Kai Sports. Welcome to True Guys Sports. For the love of football, a total of 53 cyclists from Wewak braved over 12 hours on a boat ride to Kayan, Borgia District, and cycled the remaining journey into Medang Town last weekend for the Momase Regional Besta Cup. 
with a congregation of teams from all over the Momase region, these 53 traveled by boat and cycled the rest of the journey into Medang Town to support their home teams. Isipik province came into the Momase regional qualifying competition with a total of six teams, places like Ambunti, Maprik, Ulupu, Passam, Kairuru and Team Wiwek all featuring. Though none of them made it into either the men's or women's grand final, the 53 supporters were not let down as Team Passam and the Wiwek women's team grabbed fourth placing respectively. Yes, I think no support more than I mean, like a board, me blow or make a big block convoy or can pass the two plus seventy five foot up loan, me black and backside one of my four blow boat, and now me blow or meet said land and me blah put the belief na hope na faith to say, yeah, by me blah time like sim now. By the end of the competition, the majority of ECP teams exited with placings other than the top three. Although we work women did perform well and pass some giving LFA a good run. But with the support they received, they may come back stronger next year. Diniro Strico, National MTV Sports. Lay City Dwellers midfielder and LFA captain Troy Gunemba has lauded the efforts of his elder brother Raymond as he embarks on a career overseas. The, two, the younger of the two, Troy, was part of the LFA squad that took part in the recently concluded regional qualifiers for the Besta Cup. Troy Gunemba, captain of the young LFA side to the Momase Regionals, was all praise. When asked about how elder brother Raymond was faring with new club, Eastern Suburbs, in New Zealand's Premier League, and says the experience will only benefit the Lay City dwellers in the new season. Six months I'm going to stop now, play low, up on them one uh, professional uh, club lab, low, soccer league low, but uh, low time me play, dwellers me play going low league, and by coming in joining me play, me play, play low league. Raymond Gunemba joins three other Lay City teammates currently overseas pursuing their footballing careers. These include fellow striker Nigel Dabinyaba, who is in Australia with the Northern Pride, as well as Joachim Waroy and PNG's talented attacking midfielder Michael Foster. Troy Gunemba believes that with the return of these players, either prior to the start of the new season or in it, that there will be a massive boost to the club's run for a third domestic title, as well as their burgeoning OFC Champions League run. I believe that this last season, I believe that I'm going to be able to win the province in the country. The PNG Football Association has yet to confirm the start of the new season of the Telecom National Soccer League for 2017. Jeremy Moggy, National MTV Sports. And that ends True Guys Sports. We'll have the weather details when we come back. True Kai Sports. Sports. Weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Your weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region, fine and cold although cloudy in Port Moresby and Alotau, fine in Daru, rain periods in Kerma and light rain in Popondeta. In the Momase region, rain periods in Leh, a shower or two in Medang and Wiwek and few showers in Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands, some showers and thunderstorms for Lorengau, some thundery rain showers for Kokopo, Rabaul and Kimbe, and a few showers in Buka. And in the Highlands region, rain periods for all centres. Forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours, a strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Kerama to Yule Island to Hood Point to all Million Bay Islands including Samurai Island to Cape Vogel to Fincha Fen through Vitia Strait, CSC Islands to Long Island to Medang to Bogia to Wiwek, also Manus to West New Britain. Waters of Sa 
southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Kerima to Yule Island to Hood Point to Samurai Island with waters of eastern and western Million Bay Islands and with waters of Samurai Island to Cape Vogel to Finchafen. Seas 2 to 2.5 meters. Waters of Finchafen through Vitia Strait, CSC Islands to Long Island to Medang to Bogia to Wewak, with waters of Manus and its western group of islands, and with waters of West New Britain, seas 2.5 to 3 meters. Waters of Waters west of Wewak to Aitape to Vanimo and northern PNG Indonesian border, seas 0.5 to 1.3 meters. Waters of New Island to East New Britain to Bougainville seas 0.5 to 1.5 meters. Ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea. Seas rough with southeast winds at 20 to 25 knots. In the Solomon Seas, seas moderate to rough with southeast winds at 20 to 34 knots. In the Bismarck Sea, seas rough with southeast winds at 25 to 34 knots. And in the Pacific Ocean, seas light with southeast winds at 10 to 15 knots. And that's the way it is this Friday, the 19th of August, 2016. On behalf of the news team, I am Lorraine Gabina. Pleasant viewing. Good night.